Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Rohit. I am with uh, AWS Product Marketing. It's my privilege to introduce the next speaker, uh, Shane uh, Shelton from uh, McGraw Hill Education. And Shane is going to talk about uh, their journey to the cloud, uh, challenges they faced, how they overcame, overcame some of the challenges, and the lessons uh, learned. Uh, welcome, Shane. Thanks. Thanks, everyone, for showing up to the last session of the day. <laughs> I'm sure most of you, since it's the last night in Vegas, you want to get this over with so you can go have some cocktails. I'm in the same boat, so I'm going to make this as quick and painless as humanly possible. So just to give you guys a brief overview of what I'm going to talk about today, uh, this is actually broken up into four different parts. Uh, the first part, I'll just give you a general overview of what our company does. The second part, I will give you a business overview of what we did due diligence-wise and uh, from a model, a financial model perspective uh, in Amazon to test the financial feasibility of actually doing the move. Then we'll move on to the actual technical side and the challenges that we had to overcome there. And then the last part will be Q&A, which should be pretty quick. So let's get started. So McGraw-Hill Education. Um, I like to think of McGraw-Hill Education as a software company that is trapped inside of a publishing company. Uh, all joking aside though, we still make a lot of money from print. Um, we're doing about a couple billion dollars a year. Uh, we are making a, a massive shift to digital though. Uh, the reason behind that is because print traditionally, the margins are very, very small. Uh, usually single digit, and then uh, any of you that have ever worked for a SaaS provider, you know that the margins in digital software are very high. So. We were recently divested from the McGraw-Hill companies. I'll talk a little bit about that on the business side um, and how it kind of impacted some of this stuff. Uh, we were purchased in May 2013 by Apollo Global Management. So that's part of the reason you're seeing the shift in digital because anytime you're bought by PE, they obviously want to make money. So they feel the, the best way to do that is to shift a digital product. As promised, the business side. So why would we move to a, the cloud? Why would a company of our size move to the cloud? I mean, if you've already invested so much money in building out data centers, building out or making, spending all the capital on all the servers, network equipment, all that, like why, why on earth would you do that? I mean, we're not a startup. So the number one driver for this whenever we were doing our modeling was uh, basically how do we deliver our software on a global scale and provide the best experience for our users? So we modeled this a couple of ways, and I'll go over this in the financial portion of this. Of, uh, well, I mean, we could do it in colo spaces, we could do it in managed services, we could build data centers, um, all that stuff. It's just, it's extremely expensive, and it takes a lot of time. And we've given ourselves about two years to actually do this, so uh, time is of the essence. I put an asterisk on that second bullet point, the cost reduction over the current model. We're actually in a very, uh, we're in a very weird situation in regards to how much money it costs to currently operate our IT infrastructure. So I put an asterisk there because I don't think companies that are really large, I, I, and Amazon's probably gonna get mad that I say this, I really don't think that the cost benefit's gonna be there for the bulk of companies, especially in Fortune, five, Fortune 500s. For us though, when we actually did the modeling on a actual uh, a global platform, um, it actually came in uh, substantially less, and uh, hopefully it works out for us. Um, we also have the ability to kind of redefine our processes. So uh, when I joked about the being a publishing company or a digital software company trapped in a publishing company, uh, we develop software like a publishing company. So it's, it's very drawn out. I mean, some of our products will do like a yearly release and that's it. I mean, obviously if you want to compete in the digital marketplace, you gotta, you gotta kind of streamline that. You gotta, you gotta get with the times. So what Amazon gave us was the ability to actually st streamline our processes, make them a lot more lean, uh, a lot more well-suited for agile and continuous integration. And then the flexibility piece of Amazon, which everybody knows, I mean, it's basically on tap, uh, on demand infrastructure. I mean, if you're trying to build out thousands of servers uh, in a brick and mortar data center, I mean, uh, that's gonna take months, if not years. Uh, for instance, with our Connect product, which I'll actually uh, hit on that on the technical side, um, we were able to deploy uh, about a thousand servers for the, across the entire SDLC for that product uh, in a little over two months with two people. So I'll get into the, uh, 
we were able to do that too with the automation. Uh, we used Puppet internally. So a combination of CloudFormation and Puppet, uh, we were able to automate that to uh, make the time frame uh, feasible. So why did we pick Amazon? So there's lots of different cloud providers out there, and we looked at a lot of different uh, cloud providers. Um, Amazon had data centers where we wanted to strategically be uh, on, a, on a global scale. Um, and we also, we also partnered with DataPipe, which I'll talk about here in a second. Um, and DataPipe uh, had data centers in the positions or in the places we needed to be as well. Uh, Amazon pretty much invented the cloud space, so one of the most mature providers, uh, which, is, which is always good whenever you're talking about this amount of money. Um, I put that it fits the majority of the needs. Uh, we are highly dependent on Oracle inside of our company. Um, and Amazon does Oracle RDS, but the SLAs that they give you, 99.95%, uh, don't meet our internal SLAs that we hold ourselves accountable for. So the reason we use DataPipe is we use Amazon Direct Connect to go back into Amazon and we host Oracle Rack out of the DataPipe data centers. We do this on a lot of our products. Um, one day, maybe Amazon will actually start supporting Rack, which probably won't make DataPipe very happy, but that's the model we're in right now. Um, obviously, I don't have to get into the auto scaling, being able to ride the demand curve, uh, not having to have idle capacity sitting around costing you money to run. Something that I really like about Amazon is their, their support. Um, if you guys aren't familiar with their enterprise support, uh, they're amazing. Uh, you basically are you're given dedicated resources, and if you have any issues whatsoever, pick up the phone or I can email them, and I can pretty much get an instantaneous answer. Um, my favorite thing about Amazon, and they talked about this a little bit in the keynote this morning, is they really do listen to their customers. I mean, <clears throat> I don't really toot my horn too much about vendors, if you know me, if you've worked with me in the past. Amazon's amazing from this perspective. I would almost say that they're almost obsessed with customer feedback. So we are constantly meeting with them uh, on our architectures and the challenges that we have, and they really do take that stuff into account. I mean, they announced some stuff today that I remember talking to them about six months ago. It's like, we'd be really nice if we had these features. Uh, so they listen to it, and it's not like a, a traditional development cycle where we'll get to it in two years. I mean, you give Amazon the feedback, and then they're cranking this stuff out in like three, four months later. And then overall, just the ecosystem, I mean, that kind of goes. I mean, look at the size of the conference, look at all the vendors that were actually out there. Very strong. So the million dollar question, is the cloud actually cheaper? So I've got an answer for you, and you're not gonna like it, and the answer is it depends. So cost analysis, whenever you're moving to the cloud, is uh, it's extremely important, at least it was for us. A lot of companies will get into trouble where they think they can do the cloud cheaper and then this stuff kind of spirals out of control and then you get this massive bill when you thought you were going to spend $150,000 a month and your bill comes in and you spent $600,000. That tends to make finance and accounting pretty angry. So it's very important that you actually do your due diligence here. Um, I'm going to get a little bit into, into how we actually did it. Again, it made sense in our current operating model. Uh, we actually could make this work for a lot cheaper. Uh, when I talk about realistic uh, numbers there, um, I have seen uh, companies in the past where they'll just kind of guess at the instance sizes. I mean, obviously, Amazon has tons and tons of instances to choose from. Uh, my recommendation there is to actually test this stuff. Even if you're deploying your application and it's not going to be your finalized architecture, at least just stick it up in the cloud, run some performance tests on it, and then find out the instance types you want to use. And this way, when you're actually doing your RI calculations, assuming that you're actually going to use RIs, uh, your numbers are going to be a, a lot closer than if you were just kind of pulling it out of thin air. So uh, sometimes cost savings aren't everything. Um, <clears throat> our finance people would not like that I said that. The, uh, what I mean by that is that with Amazon, it's, it's, it's a little bit different than if you have like web servers, like let's say you have Blades running Apache, and you have like this, this, massive, <clears throat> uh, this massive rack that just has Blades in it. When a blade fails, you want to repair it because that's capital you invested and then you can't just automatically scale out. <clears throat> so just think about the time that you actually save when actually running services on Amazon. If the problem isn't glaring you in the face and an Apache server's not working, then just get rid of it and deploy another one. It's very simple. So you don't have like these ops guys sitting there trying to troubleshoot infrastructure constantly. You're paying Amazon to handle the infrastructure, so you guys can focus on your product development and how do I scale my product better, how do I make it perform better, uh, basically the good stuff that differentiate, differentiate your company from other companies and why they're actually paying for your product. 
And then the last one, uh, just to reiterate, <clears throat> a lot of these, so we have a lot of products in our company, and I'm not gonna give you the exact number because I don't think you would believe me. But uh, a lot of them didn't make financial sense just due to the revenue that they actually make uh, versus what it would cost to run it inside the cloud. So we kind of broke it down, um, and I'll talk about this uh, kind of at the end whenever I get to our roadmap of the most important apps that we actually want to deploy globally, and those made the most sense to us. So the biggest uh, uh, challenges that we, uh, that we faced, so convincing a large company that's already invested enormous amounts of capital uh, into building out their own data centers to the freaking thousands of servers that we have running, all the network gear, et cetera, et cetera, um, it's hard. Uh, we did a ton of due diligence on the finance piece here and the actual feasibility to actually get um, our CIO, um, our CDO, and our CEO had actually agreed to do this. Uh, this is a pretty big pain point. I was actually talking to somebody right outside uh, that they, it, it kind of varies from the traditional model that companies like this operate in, so sometimes there's that fear of going to what's unknown. Um, so being able to prove some things out uh, actually made it a lot easier for us. Uh, for instance, whenever we were running our testing of uh, figuring out what sizes, instance sizes we should actually be running inside of AWS, um, we found out that it, uh, our web apps actually perform a lot better inside of AWS than they do in our actual data centers. So it's stuff like that that uh, you can just kind of add fuel to the fire of why a company would actually buy in to do something like this. Um, that second point, and I'm going to talk a lot about this on the technical side, is that legacy applications are extremely difficult to run inside of uh, Amazon. And let me just kind of hit on some of ours. So you see a lot of companies out here, and they're like, look, we scaled out to 10 million users in three months. Well, that's fantastic because, I mean, you built your application to run on site of Amazon. You're utilizing their services. It's made to scale like that. With us, we have a lot of different applications that are making us hundreds of millions of dollars, and we don't have the luxury of investing development time to actually rewrite those applications and then move them to the cloud. So how do I take that legacy application? How do I actually move it? Well, it turns out it's not very easy because we use a lot of different underlying technologies, uh, mainly uh, from the Oracle tool set. Those techs aren't made to scale inside of Amazon, so you have to figure out ways to actually make them work inside of Amazon. And if it doesn't work, then you have to be willing to do the, uh, the research and the development time to actually rip those products or rip those, uh, those tool sets out of your product so you can actually scale inside the cloud. I'll hit on a lot more on that. Um, namely, one of our, our, probably our biggest challenge was Oracle Coherence. Uh, it is a caching and session management layer inside of our applications. It does not play nice inside of Amazon by any means, uh, mainly because it uh, operates with the node, the inner node communication operates on very strict latencies. As you guys know, we don't, you don't control the actual uh, network infrastructure, so you're not guaranteed anything from Amazon of what are those latencies, what are they gonna be? Are they gonna be one millisecond? Are they gonna be 100 milliseconds? You, you just don't know. Um, the actual operational support piece, uh, this, is, this varies from uh, brick and mortar, just on the sheer fact, uh, probably from the governance of instead of actually like doing, getting a quote from a vendor and then putting in with finance, cutting a PO to buy like 10,000 HP DL380s or something like that. Um, you have people that have access to the console and they can just go in there and if I want to spin up a thousand machines then I'll just spin up a thousand machines. So how do you place governance around that? So having to figure that stuff out uh, is a little bit trickier than you would expect. I mean, obviously there's a lot of different companies out there like RightScale that uh, make this a lot, a lot less painless, um, uh, which is stuff that we're actually looking into right now. And then the financial piece, again, my biggest recommendation there, especially if you're running very large scale, complex applications, is just stick it out there on on-demand and just see what it does. And then you can actually get a better idea of actually how it's going to work and then what you need to use. And then the last, which is actually the most difficult thing uh, by far in, since we kicked this project off about eight months ago, was actually finding talent to actually do this. So I have an internal team, but we weren't very well versed in AWS uh, or automation. And then when you actually go out and look for these people, I mean, this stuff's still pretty new, uh, and it's very hard to find these people. And when you do find them, they command a ton of money and a lot more money than I'm willing to pay them. So, what we ended up doing is we actually used a lot of consultants um, for vetting our architectures inside of Amazon. 
And then uh, my recommendation here is that if you have good people internally that are already that have already been doing a good job for you, just invest in the training. And that's that's pretty much how we got around it. Just tons and tons of training and automation and using AWS, and we were able to knock out uh, the first portion of the project. So now on to the technical side. Uh, this is where I'll get into. Uh, what were the biggest challenges we hit, and then uh, kind of the culture shift that we, ha that we had to go through, or we're currently going through, uh, to operate in this new model. So legacy applications. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like you can just forklift the app out of your data center and stick it inside of AWS. It just does not work like that. It takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of planning. So. I just put some bullet points here of things that were very important whenever we were doing our discovery of this. Um, number one is just know what you have, and is it going to work? I mean, if, if you're using tech that's not going to work in the cloud, then you would rather discover that before you pay Amazon a million and a half dollars in reserved instances just thinking that it's going to work. Um, and then don't be afraid to use tech that, you don't, that you've never seen before. Like there's a lot of new tech out there. Uh, Amazon offers a lot, of, uh, a lot of fun services as well like NoSQL and stuff like that. If your development teams are just scared to use this technology, then you just kind of got to coerce them in to, you know, this is the right way to go, and if we're going to be in Amazon, then we need to fully commit to this thing, because if we stick this thing in the cloud and we can't scale horizontally like we need to across multiple availability zones, it's going to fail, the customers are going to be impacted, then the customers are going to leave, and then we're not going to have jobs. So uh, very important that if don't try to make a circle peg fit in a square hole inside of Amazon, or you're gonna be disappointed. Um, and then, so another key here is don't try to think you have to solve everything before you actually do a launch. A lot of our products will actually go live when they're not in their final uh, architectural state. We know this, we know that we have gaps in our architecture, and the fact of the matter is, is these are generating a lot of revenue for us, and we have certain time slots, because we're an education company, where we have to move these to lessen the customer impact. So. Basically, we, we, can, we have to do what we can do in the time frame that we're allotted. And then so we just have plans around that, okay, after launch, the next six months we're gonna do X, Y, and Z. The next six months after that we'll do X, Y, and Z to actually kind of uh, make the architecture fit and scale better inside of Amazon. And then the last one, I can't tell you how many people I've talked to that actually don't do this. Uh, application performance is very near and dear to my heart. Test your, test your software before you actually launch it. I mean, this is kind of a no-brainer, and you may be like, well, I'm not an idiot. Of course, I'm going to test my software before I launch it. There's a lot of people that don't. I mean, you can talk to people, and they're like, hey, I've got this awesome web app that runs in Amazon across four availability zones, and it's totally redundant. And Okay, well, whenever you were doing your performance testing and you killed an AZ, how did your application react? Well, you know, I mean, we didn't really test it before we launched, but we're pretty sure that if we lose an AZ, it's actually going to work. I mean, if you're buying a service, like personally, and you're paying for it, you want them to test it so it stays up, so you get what you're paying for. So why would you do that to your customers that are paying your company money? That's a rhetorical question, by the way, you wouldn't. All right, so a shift in, mind, um, shift in mindset. So... The developers and the architects uh, that we have in our company, um, you have to work within the boundaries of what AWS gives you. Uh, there's a very good document on this, and I should have put the link in this uh, PowerPoint, of the best practices of architecting software inside of AWS. I believe there's seven of them. And if you follow those, then you're probably gonna have a pretty good day at launch. If you don't follow those, then you're probably gonna have a pretty bad day. So I can't stress enough that Amazon doesn't write this stuff just because they were bored. Um, they write it because that you should be following it. Um, and then the, the final point is that uh, Amazon isn't like some mythical creature that was like m built out of magic. It's built on the exact same principles that you build your data centers on. It's still running on switches, still has routers, still has racks, still has power. It's the exact same thing. It's infrastructure, it's going to fail, architect knowing it's going to fail. So our biggest challenges, and this is just from an overall perspective, um, a couple slides down, I'll actually get into one of our larger, more complex applications. Uh, so the biggest challenges we hit just overall was uh, moving away from e F5s to ELBs. Uh, F5s obviously offer a lot of, uh, a lot of cool feature sets. Um, 
namely the main reason that we uh, like F5s is just because of content switching. And uh, ELBs, as everybody knows, they don't do that right now. So uh, this was a very big challenge for us. And we ended up going with the Amazon ELBs, namely or uh, solely based on the fact that like Netscaler's F5s, they won't run over a gig of throughput inside the cloud. ELBs, you have the option of doing a gig up to 10 gigs. So whenever we were looking at this, like, well, how do we actually want to do this? It didn't make sense to go ahead and start deploying this stuff knowing that we were going to hit up some bottleneck in the next year or so. So we kind of made the ELB work. We gave Amazon a ton of feedback saying, look, this isn't sustainable the way that this model is. You guys need to fix it. And uh, I mean, I've had many conversations with the product manager from the ELB team. So uh, hopefully they'll be coming out with features soon that'll actually address some of those concerns. Uh, the security approvals was a very big challenge. So we're still tethered to the McGraw-Hill Financial Network, which uh, because they own Standard & Poor's, we have to go through a lot of regulatory hoops. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, being a financial institution, they don't really like the fact that you're sticking stuff in a public cloud space on multi-tenant hardware. So that was a very painful process for us, uh, lots of forms. I would say it took about a month to get the VPC structure in our security group structure actually approved. Um, I dumped a lot of that on my managers, unfortunately. Sorry guys, if you're in here. Uh, the uh, dependency on Oracle products already kind of hit a little bit on that. Uh, sometimes the software, it just doesn't play nice in the cloud and it wasn't designed for it in the first place. So you probably shouldn't be using it. Um, and then one of the really big things too is uh, not being in control of everything. So I'd mentioned a little bit earlier that you can't see the network. Uh, I mean, it's, it sucks. I mean, I don't know any other way to, to describe it. I mean, when you're running into, especially when we're running in this hybrid model um, and you're getting really weird what you think is latency. And I mean, it could be a number of things, mind you. You can't dig down into the network, so it's very frustrating. I mean, there's a lot of companies that are actually starting to come out with uh, tool sets that help you do this. Uh, namely, I talked to a company uh, yesterday called Boundary where they're actually doing this on the TCP IP stack so they can actually measure the latencies between nodes so you can actually know if it's a latency problem or if you're just guessing it's a latency problem. I would say that, that that's, that's a very big hurdle to overcome. And then just the monitoring in general. So we have a bunch of different monitoring tools that we use internally. And monitoring to me is mission critical because if your monitors aren't up, then how do you know your product's up? So make sure if you're doing the jump to the cloud, that the monitoring tools that you're using will actually scale just like your products do inside the cloud and you can run them in HA mode. And I don't know what I just did. Oh, all, right. all right, so here's just a very, very high level overview of our actual global deployment architecture. Um, I had said that we were actually running a cloud hybrid model. I wasn't lying. You see the Amazon Direct Connects right there going back to the data pipe data centers. Uh, from our internal network, we run MPLS via Direct Connect to all of our VPCs. Uh, we run uh, non-production and production VPC groups. And then we have, uh, obviously, the internet coming into the different regions. Um, I did want to take this time, too, uh, and I put CloudFront up there on a, uh, for a reason uh, to kind of give some kudos to the CloudFront team here. Because we currently operate out of uh, two uh, data centers on the east coast of the United States, we have uh, quite a few customers in Asia Pac and uh, lots of complaints coming out of there about page load times. And I mean, these are, valid, these are valid complaints. I mean, some of the pages uh, are taking like 15 to 30 seconds to load. I mean, if I'm paying you a million dollars for your software, you know what, I'm, I'm probably gonna ask for a refund. So we, we looked a lot at this. Uh, obviously, we weren't ready to deploy our applications globally just yet. So we're like, okay, well, how do we actually fix this without having to do a full-blown project with development to figure out how we're actually going to do the global deployments. Um, that's where CloudFront came in. We took a ton of metrics coming out of Singapore and China, coming back to our, our east regions, um, and realized that the content loads, or the content was actually what was the problem. Uh, lucky enough for us, the content was already in S3. So I mean, literally five minutes worth of work. We lit up CloudFront. We took more performance metrics. And on average, we got about 75% performance gain on all the page loads, which is substantial. And I mean, this was literally so, this was like child's play. And the cost of CloudFront is, is virtually nothing. So thank you, Amazon. 
So the biggest technical challenges on Connect, um, I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on Connect. Um, it's our largest platform for our higher ed division. Um, it currently has about six million customers. Um, I'm not gonna go into the revenue it generates because I think our legal team might get mad because we're privately held. But some of the stuff that we actually ran into, uh, again, was the ELB functionality. The way that Connect is actually architected is that we call it a platform, but it's actually comprised of like 25 different little applications that all talk together via API. So when you're running ELBs on this stuff, because there's no content switching, uh, you can't, and we constantly are shifting the URL based on the functionality that you're accessing inside the platform, we had to deploy 25 ELBs uh, across every single zone, across every single tier, across every single environment in the SDLC. This is a management nightmare. So again, this is where you go to Amazon and you say you need to fix this so we don't have to, uh, we don't have to deal with this going forward. Um, hopefully Amazon will address it soon because that's, what we're, that's how we're operating it today. Uh, again, on the Oracle coherence thing, and I'm not trying to pick on Oracle here. Um, it's just Oracle software just wasn't made to scale on the cloud. I mean, that's, that's, it's as black and white as that. So whenever we, uh, we're doing our Oracle coherence test, uh, we, uh, we ran into a lot of issues with being able to do uh, uh, internode replication across uh, availability zones, which is a huge no-no to deploy things in a single AZ in Amazon. I mean, I think that, that that's one of the best practices. So what do you do there? Well, we talked to Oracle and we're like, well, can we do this and you guys support it? And they're saying, no, we won't support it. So our minimum of what we deploy on uh, just internal best practice is we'll use a minimum of three availability zones whenever we're deploying software in the cloud. Uh, this model I'll basically tied it down to a single AZ, um, which obviously if the AZ goes down, I mean, Amazon's never lost a region, thank God, uh, but they do lose availability zones. So if the AZ goes down, then there's gonna be a serious customer impact. So basically, what do you do? we're getting rid of coherence and we're going to something that scales across multiple availability zones. There's no other way to slice it. So on the auto scaling piece, uh, auto scaling is like one of the coolest features to me inside of EC2, um, but it's not gonna be like some saving grace for you. Because we use proprietary software uh, such as WebLogic and coherence, uh, the scale up time of these is very difficult. Um, and the reason for that is just the way that the actual software works and the way that it has to join the clusters. So there's a lot of time there. So in there, in our testing, it's about six to seven minutes. And the fact that you can't really fully automate this stuff, um, uh, whenever we were going through puppetizing our entire stack, we were running into some issues with WebLogic <clears throat> where they actually encrypt their source code, uh, obviously, because you're paying millions of dollars for the software, they don't want you to be able to decompile their code and see what they did and steal their ideas. So this is a really big problem uh, for Puppet because if you wanna fully automate the stack, you need to be able to go in there and do the uh, decompile it so you can actually go in there and be able to configure the server whenever it's coming up. So what we ended up having to do there because we aren't getting rid of web logic yet is uh, we puppetized down to what we could and then as soon as the server comes up, we're having to run dynamic scripts against it to actually finish the configuration. Unfortunately, that's taking us six to seven minutes. That works for us in about 90% of our use cases uh, are failure scenarios. The one that it didn't work in was if Amazon lost an entire AZ, how do we keep our other AZs open if you had, let's say, 50,000 customers on that availability zone? They gotta go somewhere, so they're gonna go to the other two. How do you keep those AZs up if you're waiting seven minutes uh, to actually scale it up? So what we're doing in the first iteration of Connect is we're actually gonna turn auto scaling off, which I don't recommend this, by the way. And we're actually going to over or do uh, oversubscribe capacity in each of the AZs so we can tolerate a failover until we have time to actually get rid of coherence and web logic. Uh, and then on this last point, um, don't think that you guys are just gonna like magically take a legacy app and you're gonna, it's, you're gonna automate it in like a week. It, it, this stuff takes a really long time to do. Um, it's not easy, again, with the proprietary stuff. My number one recommendation here, and this is what I'm actually moving our company to, is don't use proprietary software whenever you're trying to do automation. Use open source software. You can see all the code. 
You see the guys, uh, other guys out there using like Tomcat and JBoss, they're actually able to scale up in 30 seconds or less. You can fully bake the AMI so you can scale even faster. Uh, I just highly recommend that so you don't really run into the, any of the issues that we ran into. Obviously, this is a lot easier said than done. But we are undergoing uh, an initiative internally of taking WebLogic out and going to Tomcat. And then uh, we are experimenting quite a bit with uh, Dynamo and Elastic Cache to get rid of coherence. So the roadmap, when are we actually gonna get done with all this stuff? So we classify our applications because we have so many of them into multi-tier, or uh, we classify them by tier. A tier one application at McGraw-Hill is based on customer usage, how many customers does it have, and revenue it generates for the company. So these are the apps that we are actually going to focus on going, going forward from a global perspective. So at the end of 2013, we'll actually have moved our first one. Mind you, we run a lot of stuff in Amazon right now, but we don't have anything 100% in Amazon. At the end of this year, we will actually achieve that. 2014, we're actually gonna move the bulk of the remaining tier ones inside of our company into, into US East. We will deploy to our first global region. Exciting stuff. And we will, for the app we moved in 2013, we will actually get the multi-region architecture working to where we can actually fell over. 2015, we'll just do the cleanup. Any other legacy apps that need to go that the company sees fit that we move, we'll move. And then we'll do a full global rollout of all of our tier ones with multi-region support um, and fellover capability. And I wanted to put this slide in here because, uh, again, I mean, I'm not really uh, big on giving vendors kudos. I actually usually beat them up pretty bad. But Amazon, Amazon's been pretty awesome thus far. Um, as they continue to improve their services, all it's doing is helping our products, helping us scale better, helping us reach more customers, helping basically grow our bottom line. So uh, it's exciting to be a part of that. Uh, again, I can't reiterate enough, Amazon actually listens to their customers, where a lot of vendors, it'll just fall on deaf ears. I mean, the product managers really want to meet with their customers, and they really want to get your feedback on what they need to be sticking in their product, which I mean, it's, it's awesome to me. Uh, competitive pricing, I mean, you guys don't ever see Amazon saying, hey, we're going to raise all your rates. It's always going down. And then the excellent support that I was talking about, um, this is just from an enterprise support perspective. I've never used, like, Amazon basic support, so I can't really speak to that. But if you're in a situation and, and you want to spend the money on the enterprise support, uh, it's been amazing. So with that said, if anybody wants to delay going to happy hour, I'll take questions. <laughs>